Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to be here today in the Northern Ireland Chamber's series of economic briefings, and my, I extend my thanks also to our hosts, McGregors. I think it is helpful at a time when, let's face it, the noble profession of politics ranks low in the public estimation that organisations such as the Chambers of Commerce and McGregors are ready to support the political process by providing a useful platform for politicians, particularly on such an important issue as the future development of our economy. So I intend to give you value for money today. We all know uh, about the economic problems facing Northern Ireland. They are deep-seated. So whatever about the current global economic downturn and the four billion of cuts we're now facing in the executive budget, both of which present additional challenges at this time, we have to deal with the structural underlying problems in our economy. We have to ask why productivity is lower in Northern Ireland than in other comparable regions and what can we do about it? Why do we have such a low participation rate in our workforce? And above all, are we happy to continue as a sick regional economy dependent on an annual subsidy of some £8 billion from the rest of the UK, equivalent to more than £11,000 per household every year? We do, of course, have good things going for us as well. A young, well-educated, English-speaking workforce decent infrastructure, 100% broadband and good universities. And we're getting a flow of foreign direct investment. So it's not all bad. But if we are to move this economy forward, we have to deal with all of the challenges. Not just the immediate problems or medium-term issues, but also the long-term structural problems, some of which I have already referred to. And what levers are at our disposal? Undeniably, the most important is public expenditure. We can evolve economy-friendly policies across different sectors and try to rationalise red tape and the burden of regulation. But the most immediate impactor on our economy is how we allocate and manage public spending. So let me say a little more about the experience I suppose I had um, as a member of the executive up until last year and how the Northern Ireland executive has operated the principal economic lever of public expenditure. When the downturn hit us in 2008 and many of the assumptions underlying the executive budget, particularly in relation to forecast capital receipts, went out the window. My party put forward the case to reprioritise spending to take account of the change. We produced new priorities in difficult times, which showed where we needed to spend to keep programmes on course and uniquely where we would find additional resources. Surprise, not surprisingly, the executive did not endorse new priorities in difficult times, although it later implemented some of the proposals contained in it. And many of the other proposals have since crept into the manifestos of other political parties, and this, of course, is to be welcomed. The bit that got me at the time, though, was the repeated assertion by some of my senior executive colleagues that the economy was the number one priority, yet they were not prepared to change anything when our plans got knocked off course. So in effect, the downturn itself ended up deciding which programmes were able to proceed unscathed and which got hit with shortfalls. We also argued that we needed to be certain that capital expenditure was being directed at those areas which would deliver best bang for your buck for the local economy. But that exercise was never done either. So we invested large but finite amounts of capital without really understanding its economic impact. And ladies and gentlemen, that is being really honest about it. Let me fast forward to the budget process just completed, which has resulted in the much heralded £4 billion of cuts. 
Again, we in the SDLP produced a 70-page finance paper, unlike other parties, full of costed figures and tables, highlighting how we could mitigate much of the £4 billion of cuts through new revenue streams and additional capital receipts. Our paper, Partnership and Economic Renewal, not only showed where the extra resources should be found, it was also full of proposals, many quite radical, for rebalancing the economy. We have no irritating ideology here. We are not afraid to say the word privatisation. The various debates that followed in the Assembly were based on our amendments and our ideas, although the DUP Sinn Féin budget, which I have described in the past as lazy and unimaginative, and which I would still describe that way, still prevailed. And I want to make one political point here, and it is this. The media reported the budget exchanges largely in terms of a party political tussle, rather than in terms of different economic and financial ideas. On a similar basis, the larger parties tried to characterise those of us who had different ideas for the economy as somehow disloyal or not team players. And of course, I utterly reject this categorisation, as no party has done more to bring fresh thinking into the economic idea and to share new ideas than the SDLP. And whatever the idiosyncrasies of our unusual government arrangements, we will never accept the suggestion that we should not promote our thinking when perhaps at times we're the only party actually doing any thinking. So that is the story on public expenditure. It is our principal economic lever in the short term. And if we want to make changes that will rebalance the economy in the short term, then we simply have to revisit the budget. So what we would do now, immediately in the short term? We would refocus spending in the short term on job creation. Firstly, an unashamed initiative of public works with a large-scale programme of home insulation. I'm prepared to call this Green New Deal, if that makes everyone happy. But to be quite honest, its purpose is to provide large-scale employment opportunities for relatively unskilled workers, particularly young unemployed and former construction workers. Secondly, we can put more into well-established job-rich sectors, such as tourism. And there is something of a potential sleeping giant in tourism. Thirdly, we need to reprioritise capital expenditure into the areas that provide more jobs. 100 million more spend on new trains is 100 million injection into the Spanish economy and doesn't create a job into Northern Ireland or in Northern Ireland. I don't have all the answers in this, but I am prepared to follow the evidence and do what gives us the jobs boost. So that is the immediate short-term spending priority, jobs. Yet it throws up one of the biggest conundrums facing us into the medium and long term. Think about this. Every time we take someone out of unemployment and give them a job, that is an undoubtedly a good thing. Yet nearly all the benefit accrues to the London Exchequer. London saves the unemployment benefit that they would otherwise be paying. And London scoops the extra income tax from the new member of the workforce because that money goes back directly to the Treasury. And look at, at, look at it the other way round. Every time someone becomes unemployment, London loses their previous income tax receipts and picks up the tab for the new benefit claimant. So in terms of benefits to the Northern Ireland Exchequer, it nearly doesn't matter whether people are, un are employed or unemployed. And that is a crazy situation. And we must be the only economy where there is no real incentive to get people into work. And yet, when you actually think about it, we spend hundreds of millions helping people into work. We will not fix the problem in the short term, but we do have to fix it. 
We can also do a lot in the short term to rebalance the economy and to commence a massive programme of public sector reform. Government must start to move functions and services across to the private sector where this makes sense. There is massive scope for outsourcing. There is also scope for the disposal of assets. And again, where it makes sense, the privatisation of certain undertakings. And we have to change the culture of the civil service, particularly in the senior ranks, so that there is room for an entrepreneurial can-do <laughs> approach.